Welcome to Integrated. This is the podcast where we seek to bridge the gap between the intellect and the will so that we can grow as disciples of Christ, surrendering all that we are and all that we have to the truth. Hey guys, welcome back to Integrated. My name is Angela Erickson, and I'm so glad that you are here today. I have a really wonderful guest, um, and it's been it's been a long time in the making getting him on here. But before we talk to the one and only Jeff Cavins, please, if you are new to the channel, please like, share, and subscribe. That, of course, helps a lot so other people find this content. And this is going to be an interview that I think a lot of people will benefit from because we're going to be talking about the Bible and how to read the Bible and why the Bible is so important. I think sometimes Catholics are accused of maybe uh, not knowing their Bible well or that it's it's not as important as tradition, which just couldn't be further from the truth. So I'm excited to bring on Jeff to talk about his experience uh, going, actually putting together Bible, the Bible, Great Adventure Bible Timeline and things like that. But Jeff is recognized both, both nationally and internationally as an exciting public speaker and Bible teacher. He's the creator and founder of the pr- popular Great Adventure Bible adventure Bible study. Sorry, I'm talking so fast today Um, with Ascension Press. He also is the founding host of EWTN's weekly program, Life on the Rock, as well as Relevant Radio's daily morning show, uh, Morning Air, which I don't know if you know this, Jeff, but I actually, I've been on Morning Air a few times. Um, Yes, I didn't realize that that was something that you helped found. So that's really amazing. And you also are you have a ton of books. I'm looking at just a couple of uh, your books here. Um, But yes, very very well published author as well. So thank you for coming on to my podcast. I'm sure I missed a few things, but I'm very, very grateful to have you on. It's good to join you. Good to join you. You know, it was so funny because we, we like ran into each other. We kind of live close by. Um, and it was just very happenstance. And you happened to sit down with me and and this woman that Keith Nestor of all people connected me with. It was just such a weird providential thing. You just walked into the coffee shop and, and sat down with me and this woman who had just converted into the church. And and for her, she came from an assembly of God background and and like the Bible was a really big deal. And and you played a pivotal role in her conversion into Catholicism. And so it was just this amazing time where we got to sit down and talk about the Bible. So maybe you want to give people an idea of like why this became a passion of yours. Why why is sacred scripture so important to you and why did you decide to devote your life's work to making the Bible accessible to just your average Joe? Well, I want to thank you for having me on. Uh, You know, it all started for me when I was 18 years old. And at 18, I, uh, you know, I'm looking at what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go into my first year of college, first year of college there. Uh, I said um, no, at least temporarily to, uh, an organization out in California that I won a scholarship from uh, for stand-up comedy of all things. What? And so, what? so I, uh, yeah, I so I, um, I decided that what I would do is uh, I would get some prereqs out of the way before I go out there. And so I ended up going to college, and and it was there that I ended up having that really powerful conversion experience. And and the very first thing I did the next day after I had this, this conversion experience was I went to a, a bookstore and, uh, I bought a Bible and I brought it over to our parish priest. I said, you know, can you prime the pump here and bless this? And he says, well, we don't really bless Bibles per se. And I don't know what, what he was thinking, but uh, I said, well, can you for this one? And he did. And, uh, I went home and I'll, I'll tell you what, I didn't stop reading the Bible till today. I haven't I've never stopped. And I just read and read and read. And I couldn't even go to my classes in college and partly out of poor choice. (laughs) Speaking (laughs) of the will and the intellect (laughs) is that I just chose not to go to class because I was so taken with the word of God. And I read and I read and I read. Wow. And uh, and then, you know, that that just became my life. And I, I never saw it coming. I never dreamt in a million years that I would be involved in anything dealing with the faith because that I was just interested in in uh, in other things, you know, at the time. Mm-hmm. But my whole life changed there in uh, my first year of college. Wow! I, so I didn't know that. And and I've 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 been a part of the Catechetical Institute. I'm a graduate of this program. That's another thing that you helped start. And now we have the catech- catechism in a year. All of these things, and it's like you just there's 
I was explaining this to a friend today. Um, I, I was meeting with a friend of mine who is Protestant. She's been Protestant her whole life. And I, I said, one of the things I just love about being Catholic is that you, it, the wealth of knowledge that we have from 2000 plus years of, of church life, this living and breathing organism that is the church, it never goes dry. There's always something new to learn about and to grow in and to contemplate. And, and so much of it, there's this pragmatism, like you can look at what are the virtues and vices? And we've, we've given language to all these things that a lot of Protestant denominations haven't. It's sort of abstract when they talk about it. Um, we, we have this pragmatic approach to address vice and virtue. Um, and then at the same time, we still have the spirituality aspect and all of that is rooted in sacred scripture. And so, um, weren't you at some time like a, a Protestant pastor, you kind of left the church and, and we're actually preaching to a, a pretty large congregation. You kind of have like a, a Scott Hahn story, but you started off Catholic. Right. Yeah. I, I was raised Catholic. And, uh, when I, I, I was raised Catholic and then I ended up leaving the Catholic church. And, um, when I left the cat, when I kept left the Catholic church, I made my mind up that I was going to, uh, that I was going to be spending the rest of my life doing this. And I never, I never saw that uh, coming at all. Hmm. I missed the first one part of your question. Sorry. It was something blanked out there for just a moment. Oh, um, and I'm sure it blanked out for me too. I, I have very long winded questions, so I apologize. <laughs> I sort of have like a big setup and then, um, and then right up to the point, but, but it is, I think what I want to emphasize for our listeners is that you, it's not like you don't understand, um, any objections that people have to how Catholics read the Bible. You understand the objections very, very well from a Protestant perspective and a Catholic perspective, mm -hmm. um, which is what I want in a sense to address because, yeah. um, because when we have so many people interpreting the Bible, we get a lot of different interpretations <laughs> and, and that's why it's really important. We learn how to read the Bible because it helps us both pragmatically understand um, what the church teaches and why and how we can grow in virtue and, and develop a love and relationship with our Lord. But also it helps us in our spirituality. And that's where these two come together. We talk about integrated, bridging the intellect and the will. Um, you have to, you, you can love what you know, right? We, we, and we should rely primarily on the intellect to develop and cultivate what we know is true and good and beautiful. And that is how we can learn to love what is good, true, and beautiful. We have to know it first. Um, and I think sometimes we have a lot of people who are, there's like this emotionalism where they sort of have a feeling about something and then they intellectualize it and it sort of becomes disordered. And so reading the Bible is the crux of how we get to a place where we come to know what is good, true, and beautiful. And then we can encounter our Lord um, emotionally and spiritually. So um, I guess to start off with, how how did you start developing the adventure the the adventure great Ad adventure bible excuse me how sure. did like when did you decide that that needed to happen well it was my you know i mentioned earlier that i left the catholic church in grand a grand way i i screamed at a bishop in fargo north dakota and told him i was out of there uh, wow. i was not going to be catholic anymore and that that really that really did a number on my life my wife's life and we were out of the church and we you know what when i when i left the catholic church um i, I ended up moving to iowa and i was in catholic or in christian radio at the time and and uh in christian radio you know you're going through scripture and you're learning it constantly and uh well i just knew that that god was calling me to spend my life uh in the word of God and teaching the word of God. But one of the problems that I had before I even took my first church as a Protestant pastor was I, I, uh, I read the Bible, but I didn't understand the story. And what I'm trying to say there is that I understood that, that there were all kinds of stories in the Bible. And I knew a lot of them, you know, you know them, we got David and we've got uh, Goliath and we've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all of these various characters. And so if I mention a story in the Bible to you, you would probably say, yeah, I know about that story. But the problem that we have is that we, we oftentimes, because we don't know how to do it, we don't think of a bigger story than the individual David and Goliath or, 
or Abraham and Isaac. So what we tend to do is to think about that individual story and, and what we're missing is the grand story, uh, the epic story of the Bible, because all of these stories in the Bible that we learn from the time that we're a kid to, you know, old age, uh, all of these stories that, that we learn, we are familiar with. But the one thing that we're lacking, and I don't, I don't think it's a Catholic issue, and I don't think it's a, uh, you know, a, a non-Catholic issue, but we lack the ability to tell the story. We lack the ability to tell the story. So we go back to the Bible as a story of good, you know, good stories. And it's got verses that you can stand on and, and uh, walk with God that way. But you, you don't understand what his overarching story really is all about. You know, it, it would be, be similar to this. You're familiar with that movie, The Wizard of Oz, right? Mm -hmm. most, most people are familiar with The Wizard of Oz. Well, if, if I came to your city and I was going to put on a Wizard of Oz uh, conference. And, uh, and I'm giving a promo for it now. And I'm saying, you know, that in, in October, I'm going to be in your neighborhood, in your city. I'm going to give this amazing conference on, uh, on the Wizard of Oz. And the first talk I'm going to give is all about Kansas. And then I'm going to give a talk about Ruby Slippers. I'm going to give a talk about Tin Men. And uh, I'm going to talk about, how, you know, the... Uh, how a witch is killed with water, you know, and all of these various interesting things. And then October rolls around and I show up and there's hardly anybody there, mm -hmm. there's hardly anybody there. And come to find out, we didn't realize it when we put it together, but they've never seen the movie. Mm. They've never seen the movie, but I want them to get excited about a class on 10 men and you know, scarecrows and uh, yellow brick road and little people and everything, you know, but they have nothing to base it on. They don't know the basic story. And that's what mm -hmm. happens in, you know, studying scripture is that people, they, uh, they want to study the Bible. They want to read the Bible. They want to use it for devotions, but it is more like an encyclopedia to them than a story. And mm -hmm. a story is what grabs our hearts and story is what God has revealed himself in. And so it really would uh, behoove us to, you know, to teach our children and every teacher teach their students and every priest teach their people. This is how you read the Bible so you can mm -hmm. understand it. Well, it's kind of liberating, too, in a sense that when you understand that there's a bigger story, um, I mean, there are some you do have some more questions, I think, of course, because then you're like, oh, my goodness, all of this does connect. So how does it all connect between the Old Testament and the New Testament? But at the same time, there's kind of a freedom of like, wow, this has a, everything is intentional in sacred scripture. Every word uttered in the word um, is like, there. there's a purpose there. It's not just, I don't know, it's just kind of there. Like this, this random story isn't just there to, to scandalize us, for example, or, or whatever. I mean, there's a purpose behind every single story. Um, and, and it's pointing to Christ every single part of it is pointing to Christ over and over and over again, but sometimes we can't see it. And so when we do see it, it's like this revelatory, wow, the big, wow, I cannot believe how beautiful and incredible this mm -hmm. story is. And it's part of my story. It's part of my history, um, in a way. So, um, how, how should Catholics and Christians in general, how should we approach reading sacred scripture? There are like, I I've heard you say there are four ways to read sacred scripture, um, or for, for, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. How would you explain different ways to read sacred scripture and what we can glean from it? Well, I think there's as many ways as people come up with. Right. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, but there's, uh, the one way that's kind of popular since you don't know the story, since people don't know that there's actually a, you know, an overarching story there. And then what they do is they kind of treat it like a, a book of sayings that are, yeah. you know, in a holy way, magical, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not, that's not what is, that's not what we have in the scriptures at all. The, the first thing that we have to do is we have to realize that there is an overarching story. The only two things that you have to deal with then, or to work with, I should say, is you have, you have a time period of the entire story of the Bible from, from creation to today. And then, so you have you have time, but then you also have books in the Bible, and we have seventy three books uh, in the Catholic Bible, and uh, so you have all of these years 
and you have these 73 books that tell the story. You know, it ends all the way in the book, the book of Revelation. So the question is, how do we divide all of this up? You know, I think that I think that uh, the genius to any program that uh, or a teaching endeavor that really, really works is simplicity. And it's the ability to take the complex, which the Bible is certainly uh, incredibly complex. And you you make the complex simple. That's the first thing that we had to do in creating the Bible timeline, which I, I created that when I was 25 years old. Can you believe it? A long wow. time ago. Back when I was a back when I was a uh, a a Protestant pastor. But um you you uh, you have to take the entire period of time and then you have to divide it up. And so what I decided to do was to divide the entire period of the Bible up into 12 periods. And so we have these 12 periods that we divide salvation history up into, and then I'd have a name for every period and uh, the actual uh, uh, color. I have a color that I would assign to every single period because using mnemonic devices, uh, memory devices really helps you uh, in learning, in learning anything really. Mm -hmm. And so I assigned a color to every single period and uh but then i've got the same problem kind of you know i've got the same problem and that is well how am i going to read through this i can see all these periods of salvation history but how do i read through it well to do that i've got to i've got to take the books in the in the bible that are narrative in style in other words they keep the story moving Mm -hmm. And uh, most people make the make the uh, mistake of trying to read the Bible from Genesis on, and they get lost immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, they get they get so lost. What we have done, I say, keep saying we because it's always been my wife working with me and and such a great team. But uh, what what we did is we chose the fourteen narrative books that keep the story going. So when we when we come up with the twelve periods. And then we lay over on top of that the 14 books that will read through the entire story. Then you have some kind of uh, roadmap on which to go. So you start in Genesis and, and we identify the, the 14 books, 12 periods, 14 books. And we start reading those 14 books through the 12 color-coded periods. And when you are done doing that, then what I recommend to people is go back and do it again, but start putting some of the other 59 books into where they belong and uh, in, their, in their proper order so that you are listening to the prophets, you're listening to the Psalms, you're listening to Leviticus, everyone's favorite book. You're yep. listening to them in their proper context. Mm -hmm. And so when you put all that together, it just sings. It just sings. And I remember, still remember the day uh, that I ended up coming up with it. I was taking a Hebrew course at the University of Minnesota. I was a young pastor, my first year or two. And I, I was frustrated because I had been through Bible college. You know, when I left the Catholic Church, uh, I was totally given over to uh, the Assemblies of God Church. That was the church that I was, uh, that was uh, the church that I was a part of. But the, um, I'm trying to remember where I was going with that. What was the question again? You were frustrated with something when you were in your freshman oh, year of, of, of school at the U of M. I mm. was, yes, I was frustrated that I could not sit down and tell you the entire story of the Bible. And this is after school. This is after all of it. I couldn't tell you the story. And that frustrated me. And we had uh, one child on the way, our first, and I wanted to be prepared to tell her about uh, salvation history. And it's kind of interesting in this, we talk about being integrated, and I know that's a real theme in your show, uh, an integration between the disciplines. Uh, so a lot of times people will ask me, well, how did you come up with that idea to do that exactly? And it was very quick, and it was a matter of an, a number of things being integrated together. Uh, one was I wanted to tell the story and I wanted to, to, uh, to be able to share it with my, with my kids one day, but I wasn't sure how to do it. As I was sitting there in the car, I was listening to a, a couple of cassette tapes, long time ago, cassette tapes 
uh, about a, a uh, archaeologist, an Old Testament archaeologist going through the history of archaeology, all the way from the Copper Age, all the way through the, the Iron Age. I wasn't even that interested in what he was saying, but it was the way he said it that caught my attention. The way he, he stitched together the entire story of salvation history, that, I don't even remember what he said, but that's what I caught, hmm. was that he could do it. And I thought, man, I want to be able to do that. And the first thing I thought of was one of my favorite guitar players in the world, Phil Keggy, is a Christian artist. And when he would play his guitar, his electric guitar, eyes were closed, never looked down at the fretboard. This guy was like one with his, you know, guitar. And I thought, man, I want to, I want to be able to tell the story of salvation history that way. I want to be able to go through all these different periods. And my first idea for the Bible timeline chart was actually a guitar fret. A fretboard. Oh, interesting. And that mm -hmm. was you might see, I got some guitars back there, but um, but the fretboard was what I first thought of is I can go all the way up and tell the story somehow. That can become the sort of the, uh, the metaphor that I'm going to use to tell the story. That went away very quick because I realized I have set myself up for failure because I'm going to have to teach people about a fretboard. Oh, and they don't know that yeah. necessarily. Yeah. So I went back to what could I do? And it, it was, Angela, it was just like this. Right in front of me, I saw the chart. Hmm. I let, I saw it and I thought that's what, that's what I could do. And I thought of all the different parts of it. And I got so excited. I was writing it down, writing it down. And I, I didn't go to class that day. I ended up going, uh, down to a meat market to get a big piece of paper. And I went down to, it was like an art store where I got some markers and all these different colors. And I went home and I was living in my mother-in-law's basement at the time. We were brand new to the Twin Cities as young pastors. And uh, I laid everything out on the table downstairs, got my books out, and I began to create this chart as I saw it, how it'd be mm -hmm. divided up. And I stayed up for 48 hours and uh, finished it. And the Bible timeline chart that you, you see today, and it's baked into the Bible, uh, the Great Adventure uh, Bible, that is probably, I think that day when I was 25 years old, I got about 85% of it. And that, because wow. it's a little bigger now because I'm, I'm, because you got a bigger Bible. I got a bigger Bible. It sounds like a, <laughs> sounds like a, a nice uh, t shirt or a bumper sticker. That's so funny. Got wow. Bigger, that's Bible. amazing. Yeah. I, it's, it's, and so how has that like transformed for you and how have you seen it transform how other mm -hmm. people, like other people's lives? Because, um, I feel like when you start connecting the dots like that, I mean, obviously I, you look at COVID and uh, Bible in a year with father Mike Schmitz and the way that that took off in such an unexpected and beautiful way, people are thirsting. And just mm -hmm. they have such a deep desire to understand understand sacred scripture that they were willing to listen to a Catholic priest 365 days a year, regardless of if they were Catholic or not, to understand the word better and see the way that it's integrated between the Old right. Testament and the New Testament to see the whole story. What has that? I mean, when was this? Rev, this had to be revelatory for you. But what has it been like sharing this with quite literally the world? It was a revelation to me when I was 25. Uh, it seems normal now, you know, that I'll tell you what seems normal. What seems normal is that God tells his, his revelation in a story. What is abnormal is to be a Christian and not hunger after and look for that story. Mm -hmm. That's what's abnormal, you know, about that. But um, I think for me, when, when I got I got it, and I understood the story, and I understood all the seventy-three, you know, seventy-three books of the Bible, sixty-six back then, but seventy-three uh, books of the Bible, and I, I understood all of that, and I know what it did for me personally. I came to know God so much deeper, so much deeper than than just uh, a little teaching here, a little teaching there, and there doesn't seem to be any real obvious logical connection here. But once you see the entire Old Testament, and then you see Jesus uh, reliving the Old Testament, but as the faithful son, uh, it's like it's like fireworks go off. 
inside mm. inside of me and i get really excited about it and so when i created that that first chart i i didn't tell you this but i i didn't share it with anybody it i didn't it wasn't even an idea it was just my aid <laughs> it was just for me to ro roll out and put on my desk and study the bible with and i'd wow. roll it back up bring it home and i didn't even tell anybody about it for quite a while and and I didn't um, I didn't make it available to the public for a year or so. I it was just for me, you know. Wow. So if I knew what that happened to me, then if I can present this in the right way, it's going to happen for other people. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it did. And I started to realize very quickly that this was a real uh, a black hole in people's in people's you know spiritual life is that. They didn't know the very story that everything we believe as Catholics springs from, mm -hmm. you know, even the way that the catechism is put together. Uh, the catechism is, an, is a wonderful, uh, you know, complementary work. They work, they work together so beautifully. When uh, we put together a Bible in a year, you know, we use the great adventure system. So what we did is we took the, we took the three uh, months version and we, we, brought it out you know for the whole year we stretched it out for the for the whole year and so that's the same thing we did with the catechism but when you put these two together you have a, a tremendous one-two punch that uh that really one speaks to the other and the other speaks to the you know they speak to each other is what i'm trying what i'm trying yeah. to say so here's how it happens when we look at catholicism this is what people experience. It's what's happening in families around the around the world. When you first look at Catholicism and you go into a Catholic church, it can be very overwhelming if you're not Catholic. You walk in there and you see statues. You see uh, you see an altar. You see um, uh, you see candles. You have priests. You have sisters. You have kneeling, standing. You have you have all of these things. It's like a sensory uh, overload. And the question is, well, how does that child that grow, grew up in that, how does he grow up and share this thing called Catholicism or this story of salvation history in our life? How does he share it with someone? How does she share it with, with someone? And the answer is by saying things like, well, you know, if someone comes up to him and says, well, what do you guys believe as Catholics? Well, you know, we believe in, you know, Jesus and um, uh, com uh, communion, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we go to confession. Um, Mary, we ask her to pray for us. We have a, a rosary. It's got a bunch of mysteries. I'm not sure how many, but it's got a lot of, you know, and that's sort of how we share with people is these little, we have nothing to share with them as turn in terms of a story or how it's impacting me. It's mm -hmm. like a theology course. Well, we believe this, we believe this, and we believe this. So what, what the, uh, catechism does is it takes this pile of Catholicism that we end up with after we graduate from high school. So many Catholics do. They have this pile of Catholicism, especially if they went to, you know, private school. And they they graduate, but they have no idea how to organize their faith or how to access their faith. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the catechism, you have a gift from the church that is going to divide everything we know up in the in no in the catholic church you know divided up into four pillars so we've got pillar number one pillar number two three and four and so the church has done us a great favor in not only dividing up the faith for us to make sense but also showing us where the bible which is what we're talking about fits in mm -hmm. so what are those what are those four pillars well the first pillar is the creed and what's the creed well the creed is the story of salvation history. It is God's story. It's the entire story, okay? That's the creed. So there, now the creed comes first for a reason, and that is that pillar two, three, and four are gonna all spring, spring, spring from this amazing story. Mm -hmm. So that tells us right, right then that if we don't know the story very well, then how are you going to come to understand the second, third, and fourth pillar? It's going to be very difficult, uh, and again, you're going to you're just going to get snapshots of the faith rather than the richness of the the whole the whole faith. So, number one, we have the creed. Number one, 
And that's the largest part of the catechism. Number two is sacraments and liturgy. And what's that? Well, sacraments and liturgy is how you get into God's story. The creed was the story. Sacraments and liturgy is how you get into that amazing story. And then the, the third one is life in Christ, the moral law. What's that? That's your script on what you are to live in this amazing story that you you know what your life is supposed to be. You are a child of God, and you are making Christ known. You're living his life. You don't have to spend your life wondering, who am I, man? You know, I feel lost. I got to get myself together. No, I know who I am, and I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm living the life of Christ. And then prayer is what stitches this whole drama together. We pray as a, as a community. We pray individually. In every part of the catechism, prayer is essential. But the thing that I wanted to, to leave you with on this point is that if you don't know the story, which all this springs from that story, then what is your faith going to be based on? And what are you going to turn to if you are challenged or mm. if you're going through a real difficult time? That's where the Word of God comes in in a powerful way. You know, it's so interesting because as you describe the four pillars of the catechism, it uh, it, it strikes so similar to me as, as the four senses of sacred scripture with, uh, you know, the literal interpretation with exegesis, and then you have the typological, you have the moral life, <laughs> the moral way of reading sacred, sacred scripture as well, and then the anagogical. Ana I can't even say it. Can Anagogical. You say it? Anagogical. <laughs> Thank you so much. But it's like, though, it's funny because I was talking to this friend of mine today. I'm going to keep bringing this up because there are so many things. It was like, it just felt like a primer for this interview because she asks so many good questions and, and some of her questions centered on like, well, questions of salvation. How, how do Catholics view salvation? Because I've heard it described one way, but I want to hear from you. Um, what what you think uh, makes someone saved. And, and so I had to be really honest with her about what the church teaches. And I said, no, the church, I mean, the church teaches you have to be within the church to be saved. But I also have to, there is this nuance there, right? Like God is not bound by the sacraments. We are. And so there's this, there is this little bit of like, yes, here's what the Bible says. You need to be baptized. You need to convert and then follow the church. Here's the tradition, all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, when we're reading sacred scripture, there are so many things that um, I was seeing her interpret one way, and then I'm bringing to her the Catholic interpretation and then and the catechesis, the catechism aspect of it. Um, how do you like present this as a Catholic to someone who's Protestant when they're hermeneutic or whatnot is so, it can be so different. Like mm -hmm. talking about John six, for example, how do you, how do you, what's the best way to approach the bread of life discourse? Because, um, they're gonna say, well, no, that's just about spirit and life. Well, what do you say? How, how has the church interpreted that through millennia? Because that's a pretty core component when we as Catholics believe that the, the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. Yeah. Well, if, with, if I get what you're asking, you're you're asking about John chapter six. How do we see that differently? Yeah, than... and like, how would you convey that to somebody who <clears throat> does not believe that um, that interpretation? As far as the Eucharist goes, yeah, or any of any sort of similar scripture texts, you know, yeah. Sure. Well, I think that the the first thing you have to you have to do is <clears throat> excuse me is you have to. Um, you have to see the Bible as as a whole, and that's you know people ask me well, how should I go about studying the Bible? Learn the whole thing real quick, and that's what we try to do with the Great Adventure. But it's important because when you when you see the Old Testament, when you see the Old Testament, and you realize that at the end of the Old Testament, it's like a story that never had an ending. We're waiting, and then Jesus comes on the scene. What Jesus does is he goes back. And he relives the entire story in the Old Testament. And, he, and sometimes it's rather obvious, and at other times it takes some digging. But basically, Jesus had his, his eyes on that story. Uh, we don't come to the time of Jesus, and he says, well, you know, let's be thankful. We're out of that. That didn't work. You know, we're going to start something new. 
No, he doesn't start something new. He fulfills that which is, and now he's he's ushering us into a a new era, the kingdom, uh, the kingdom of uh, of Christ. And so, uh, you asked so many questions in your question. I can, my mind keeps so going sorry. back and I forth. Need to, yes, no. So, so let's just use John six as an example. And we have we have these different senses of sacred scripture. Um, how let's, maybe let's just do that. Like an exercise of if you're reading John six and you have four different senses of scripture, how would you read a verse like, uh, or okay, read the, I see what you're saying. Yes. Okay. We'll stick on that one. Right there. Yeah. Let's stay there. Okay. So when we, when we look at the, at the scriptures as Catholics, we do look at the scriptures differently than many Protestants do. And the reason for that is that the word of God was given to the church and it came from the church and it's within the church that we, we come to, to understand it. So for example, in our studies, and you mentioned this earlier, we have, we have the literal sense. The first thing that we want to do when we study the Bible is we want to look for the literal sense. That doesn't mean, what does it mean literally? It means that we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at the background. We're going to look at the language. We're going to look at types of literature used. We're going to look at archaeology. We're going to look at all of these different things. And so we get a, a better idea of what was the intentionality of the author. What was the author trying to tell us? If the author was Isaiah, what is Isaiah trying to show us? Okay. So that's the first thing we do. Then the, se the second thing we do is we begin to look at what's called the spiritual senses. It's really called the spiritual sense, but there's three aspects to it. And so we have the allegorical sense. Any, anything we're looking at in the Bible, the first thing we're going to ask ourselves after the literal sense is the allegorical sense. How does this relate to Jesus? Because the Bible is Christocentric. It, it all has its, its final end in Christ. So the allegorical sense is, I wonder how this what this means as far as Jesus, okay? And I'll give you an example of this in just a second. Then the, the second uh, spiritual sense is called the moral sense. Uh, and that is, how does this relate to me in my life, in my, my conduct? And then comes uh, the anagogical sense. And that is, and you mentioned this earlier, it's how it relates to the future. So we as Catholics, uh, in paragraph like 110 to 120, we have a wonderful outline of how we go about interpreting this and how we receive it. But the key that I really want to get across is that the basic hermeneutic is that we have the story in the Old Testament, and it didn't end well. God came. God so loved the world that he, he came, he, brought it, he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he is constantly reliving, reliving the story. So as a Catholic, no, number one, I don't see a lot of people out there who use that as their foundation. And that is that you have the Old Testament and then Jesus is reliving all of that. And that's what the Great Adventure Study is all about. That's what Matthew is all about, is we went through the entire Gospel of Matthew and we saw how Jesus fulfilled all of this. He fulfilled all of it. So the, the thing that I think that makes us really different is that we listen to the church when it comes to interpreting and understanding the scripture. Why? Because it was from within the church that the word of God came. And it was never meant to be interpreted all by itself nor one person's uh, strict interpretation, but as a community. And, and so we, we go through this rigor of, we want to make sure that we're not going ahead of the Word of God, and we're not lagging behind or, or way out of bounds, but we're going to study it with the church. So that means that the early church fathers, those first 400 years of, of uh, incredible leaders, we listen to them. Uh, they have a certain authority. We have uh, the doctors of the church who have tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous background and uh, skilled at, at uh, dividing the word of God. So it's just such a 
much bigger perspective. Bible study in the Catholic Church is way bigger than it is in the church that I came from. Hmm. It's way bigger. You know, in the 19, I think it was the 1960s, J.B. Phillips wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. And, uh, and I found out that earlier on in my life, my God was way too small because I could figure him out, you know, for the most part. But when I came back to the Catholic Church, I've got to tell you, my whole universe expanded. The church expanded. It, it wasn't just me and a few people meeting at a, a small church down the road. It was me and the communion of saints from the beginning, all of us worshiping the Lamb, uh, the Lamb who was slain. And mm -hmm. so my family is bigger. My understanding of the scripture is bigger. It's deeper than anything I'd ever seen before. But I, I think that the thing that that changed was not the church. I was the, the, the one that changed. And I was the one that was introduced into this incredible pool of revelation, if you will. Well, and it's interesting that you bring that up because... Um... That that was kind of one thing that my friend brought up today was, well, if you're submitting to authority like the Pope um, and but but like w something about submitting to the authority of her pastor, um, she couldn't see the difference between the two. Um, why? Why is your Pope better than than like my pastor? Basically, I think that's what sure. she was trying to get at or. Or if that's not legitimate, then why should I choose the Pope over you? And and you hit the nail on the head. It's because it's not just the Pope. The Pope is not like a dictator who who determines everything. I mean, there's a community there and a communion that goes back thousands of years. And and this is where we come up with um, right. what the church, this is how, how it has developed over right. time. Right. Well, so there's a historical basis for it and a scriptural basis mm -hmm. for the papacy. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that many Catholics don't know how to share that with others. And yeah. when the question comes up like that question, uh, it's good to know to, to know a, a few things, you know, about the papacy. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one, it's it's biblical, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if we had an mm -hmm. hour, we would go through uh, all of that. But it's also historical in that Jesus left authority to do what? to run his kingdom. And there was one position in the in the Old Testament called the Al-Habayit in Hebrew. It means the one who is over the household. The one who is over the household is considered like a prime minister in the Old Testament. You can read about it in Isaiah 22. It has a full description of the prime minister. And the prime minister's role is to, uh, is to lead and to guide and to protect if the king is either sick, missing, or has passed away. The next position is the prime minister, the al habayit the one who's over the over the household. Now, the thing in Isaiah that that is very very uh, special about this is that that position is the only one who gets the keys to the kingdom. Now, I didn't make that up. That's the Bible. That's history. And so we have a list of different. Uh, of different uh, prime ministers that were in the Davidic kingdom and afterwards Sol the Solomonic kingdom. And in the Isaiah talks, he talks about this. So we didn't make this up. Now, when you come to the New Testament, and if you know that in the Old Testament, the prime minister, the one who is has a, a, a primacy among the, among the 12, uh, if you know that in the Old Testament, that Al-Habayit, that prime minister, has the keys to the kingdom, and it's the only one, mm -hmm. then you come to the New Testament, and Jesus, he takes his uh, disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, up by uh, border of Lebanon today, yeah. and he said, uh, who did they say that the Son of Man is? Well, the Son of Man is a title for the Messiah. And it's the highest title, Son of Man. Jesus refers to himself as Son of Man more than all other titles combined. Mm -hmm. Well, we get this from Daniel 7, where it speaks about the Son of Man who will have a kingdom and power that will never, that kingdom will never, ever end. And so we, we have this, uh, this image of the prime minister, and the prime minister in Isaiah gets keys Jesus now says, who do they say the Son of Man is? And they said, well, it's, it's Elijah, Jeremiah, 
one of the prophets, John the Baptist, wrong, 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 wrong. But who do you say that I am? Jesus said, and they said, you are Christ. Peter said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven revealed this to you. And I say, you are Peter and upon this rock, I'll build my church. And then he says, and I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Now, if there's only one example of this in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. everybody standing around that day knows exactly what's happening. And that is, oh my, Peter is going to be the prime minister of this new kingdom. He's going to be the Al-Habayit. And sure enough, when Jesus ascended to heaven, who's in charge? Peter, mm -hmm. the Al-Habayit, the prime minister. This isn't rocket science. Uh, this isn't uh, twisting scripture in any way. Right. It's just the way it was. But here's the deal. If you're not looking for it, you won't find it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're not looking for it, you won't find it. I remember years ago, if you have that, just the time for this, a few years oh, yeah. ago, um, I went. I was invited to this humongous, uh, it was like an evangelical uh, music festival. They had like a, I don't know, 100,000 people there or something like that. And uh, the, the, uh, the guy who invited me to go to that, uh, he invited me. I was the only Catholic, but he invited me because he was raised Catholic and left the church but had read my book, uh, My Life on the Rock. And oh, he wow. wanted to talk to me in person, and this is the way he did it. He invited me to be a speaker at the conference, which that's what I did. But, but I, I was, uh, I was there at the conference when I, when I went to the hotel there, uh, I think Amy Grant was there. There was uh, a bunch of other singers as, you know, Michael W. Smith. It was really the big thing and I didn't sing. <laughs> so I'm standing in the line and this guy walks up to me and he says, you're him, aren't you? And I said, I don't know. He's him. <laughs> You're the guy on TV that that left the you you uh, you left the church, then you went back to it. I said, "That's probably me." Yeah, that's that's me. And he goes, "I got a problem with you." And I said, "What?" And he said, it's "About the papacy. You guys have just totally made this up as a way to control people." Not at all. You know, the same type of thing. And uh, he said, "Yeah." He said, Where do you find that in the Bible? And I said, well, can I just check in real quick? And so I checked in and I walked over, I got my Bible and I gave him this 20 minute lesson on Isaiah and Matthew 16. And, you know, who do they say the son of man is and about the history in the Old Testament, uh, I, all of that. And as I, I finished, he looked at me and he said, yeah, that's what it says in your Bible. But, but I said, well, do you have a Bible? He goes, yeah. And he grabbed his. Little did he know I had my, my Protestant Bible was the one I had with me that day. Oh, funny. And it was oh. the same translation as his. So I said, sure. So he got it. I read it. It was identical. And I said, now look at the, look at the footnote here in Isaiah 22, where it speaks about the al Habayit. It says, Matthew 16, keys to the kingdom. And he goes, okay, I, this is enough. I, this is freaking me out. And he said, I got to go. And he left. He left. Mm. And, and, and that was, uh, that was too bad because we were having such a good, you know, a little Bible study there, but people have to be open to the truth. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to be open to if Jesus wants to reveal himself and it's much bigger than you've been accustomed to give into it. Let him reveal himself. He has so much for you and, and to just hold on strong to something that you heard that somebody taught it's that it's a lot to wager right there. You're going to lose a lot rather than what has the church always said? What did it say for the first four, you know, 400 years? Mm -hmm. Did anybody believe X, Y, Z, or what did they believe, you know, 400, uh, for four, four, 400 years there. That's, that's what got me to be honest with you, Angela was my inquisitiveness, my hunger. And I got to the point where in coming back, to the church, I said, I said, Lord, if if I have to be Catholic to receive you, then that's what I'll do. So it wasn't anymore this, you know, fighting theology and arguing. It was, I just want as much of Jesus as I can possibly get. And as I look back, I see, I see 
this church and what they taught. And I see the independent charismatic church that I'm pastoring as there is very little in common here at all, mm. very little. And that's what put me over the top as far as what I would say is a, a spiritual um, um, crisis of, oh my, the church that I'm giving my life to prior to coming back to the church doesn't have anything in common with that early church. It's really uncanny when you look at it. So I thought either I've got to uh, continue on and just sort of pretend I didn't read all that, or I got to figure out if that church still exists in the world today. And you can imagine the shock I felt when I uh, found out it was the Catholic church, the very church mm -hmm. I, I left. Well, and it, it's so interesting, your story, because it highlights and this is why it's important. I think it's so important to have this conversation because the Bible is not, it wasn't put together in a vacuum mm -hmm. and you cannot read it and understand it without the context. Like you're describing the historical context, all these other things come together and they integrate, they coalesce into this really amazing book, but we have to, in our intellect, um, we have to assent to that. We have to assent to all of it and accept that this is, this is how it is. It's not how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. It's not, um, it's not any of those things. It's not, it's not, Oh, well, I saw this, this person, this Catholic one time who's a total hypocrite. And now all Catholics are bad. You know, we're a church of hypocrites <laughs> and, and you know what, we're not the only one. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's why we always have to turn towards what, what has it always been? Um, and so I just love that part of your story. Do you have any um, like tips or recommendations for anyone who is getting started? Maybe it's like, yeah, I want to start the Bible in a year or, sure. or I need to open my Bible more, but I don't know where to begin because I'm a mom with five screaming children and I feel like I never get enough time to myself. And I'm right. that's just hypothetical here. Yeah. Um, but like, how, what would you recommend for, for people? Yeah, well, that's a good question. You know, when it comes to, when it comes to, uh, studying the Bible. That's the number one question I think I get is, where do I begin? How do I go about it? And I know what the typical answers are. Like, for example, someone will say, well, read John. Mm -hmm. well, fair enough. I mean, it's a universal audience. It's gospel. You can't go wrong reading a gospel, that's for sure. But uh, when I, if, if I hear someone say that, I, I, I'll say, it's always good to read John. Read John. But what I would encourage people to do is to learn the the whole story right away. Now, there's two things that I have created that helps people do that. One is quick, one's long, and the and it's the Great Adventure Bible Studies. What I did, as I was mentioning earlier, is created a study that was built around tw uh, 12 periods and then 14 books to read through those 12 periods, and I call it the Great Adventure. And on the chart, you have the color-coded system, and every major character, every major event in salvation history is all on the chart. So in one chart, I give you the story, and then what I would encourage you to do is to either go through the, the eight-week uh, Unlocking the Mystery of the Bible, where I give you eight half-hour lessons with workbook, and there's, a, and there's questions and responses for small group discussion as well. It was filmed in an opera hall and really beautiful uh, in Philadelphia. And then there's also a longer one, which is 24 one-hour talks that I give from Genesis all the way to Revelation, where I lay out my life work of this is the story. This is the whole story of salvation history. And I promise you, you can understand it. If you'll give yourself over to this and you'll roll up your sleeves and say, Lord, I want to know you, you can know this story. And that's the that's the story of the great adventure, uh, you know, all these all these years. So the first thing is get to know the basic storyline, and then we encourage people to go into Matthew after that, and then the Book of Acts in the great adventure uh, in the great adventure system. So that's that's what I would recommend right away there. But I would also recommend a discipline to go along with that because there are two kinds of studies. There's there's serious Bible studies, which is what the great adventure is. It's, it's a really a, a very serious, deep Bible study. Uh, but then there are devotions. And my study here in my office is one thing. Uh, this isn't where I do my devotions. I do those in the morning with my wife downstairs. And, uh, and so 
the Bible should be involved in your life, both in study, but also in your devotions. One is understanding God better, understanding him, and the devotions are really dealing with your heart and where you're at. And you've, you've studied, you've got this understanding, you want this to, to rest in your heart and to, uh, to lead and guide you, you know, in your life. So Lexio Divina is a nice devotion. Um, and Ascension Press has a wonderful book by Tim Gray, uh, Praying Scripture for a Change. It's a very good book. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you learn to, uh, you learn to pray the scriptures that's what that's what Lexio Divina is. You pray the scriptures. So I would encourage people to be involved both at a, a devotional level and then also at a serious uh, study level. And uh, it, it never, ever stops. You know, I was 18 when I had that conversion experience. And all these years, it, it just got better and better and better. And I, I am in more in love with the scriptures today than at any other time in my life. And I think that that's because ultimately Bible study and devotions is not a personal relationship with theology, but it is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a person. Bible study is a conversation. Bible study is uh, uh, is a revealing of God revealing Himself to me and to and to you. And so you have to keep that in mind in a Bible study and in devotions is that I'm handling the Word of God, which is a person. The mm-hmm. Word of God is a person. It's not a thing, you know, and it's not something to uh, to sit and argue about. It is precious. It's God's Word. He's revealing Himself uh, to us. So that so that's what I'd recommend if people are interested in the in the Bible and try to go into the Bible study uh, with uh, with a uh, with no no prejudgment as to mm. what you know is absolutely right. Just listen to the story of salvation history evolve as God is revealing himself. And another thing, you know, Angela, that I'm, it's my whole background, though, is that for me, understanding uh, the New Testament and understanding Jesus' teaching, in order to do that, it's, it's important to start to try to understand the world of the Jews in the first century. And that's when we look at manners and customs and, and so forth. Uh, and those are things that are easy enough to learn. You can learn about the manners and customs of the family, of eating and uh, worship. It really depends on how hungry you are. It really mm. does, you know, because it's not going to just, you're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and just, well, wow, I've got this infused revelation now. That was that was cool. Well, yeah, you spent in one night sleeping. You've got twice as much as I did in a lifetime. That's a pretty good deal. It doesn't happen that way, though. You know, right. typ- typically, it doesn't. It doesn't happen that way. So you've you've to have an understanding of Jesus, the rabbi. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus taught as a rabbi. Rabbis taught a certain way. Jesus employed that. Let me show you what he did. And when I do that, then people are like, "Whoa! I never saw that in there." Mm. I know because we have to be taught. And and I would say I would say something you don't hear typically, and that is this. In our relationship with the Bible, you have to be taught. What do you mean, Jeff? You have to be taught what you're handling here. Yeah. You can't just say that it's whatever you want it to be, you know? Mm-hmm. You have to learn how to handle the the Word of God. And if you handle the Word of God in, in reverence and awe and let God speak to you, you're going to be blown away by what you see. Uh, you know, when I was when I was younger and I was studying before I came back to the Catholic Church, let's say I knew that much. Now it's like, whoa, it's so much deeper. And 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 I can't exhaust it, you know, because the fountain, as St. Uh, uh, Raphael said, he said that the the um, studying the Bible is like drinking from a drinking fountain. Don't be discouraged by everything that falls to the ground. Mm. You know, like, I'm not getting it all. I'm not getting it. I feel so stupid. Don't be discouraged by what falls to the ground, but be encouraged that the fountain exhausted you and not you exhaust the fountain. Mm. And that there's always going to be more. There's always going to be more. So don't, you know, don't feel bad about what you're missing. Go after it, you know, go after it. Yeah. And I think at different chapters of our lives, all of a sudden, 
are because because we have grown and we've changed then when we come back to a certain scripture that we feel like oh i'm not getting it all of a sudden this growth whatever happened or maybe you're in a different state of life and you're looking at this going oh i get it now i actually get it now because mm -hmm. i just didn't have the right disposition at that time or experience or or didn't know enough about god himself to yeah. really understand what he was trying to say to me at this time or you know, I you know you know when the when uh COVID hit, when COVID hit, that was when we were developing the Bible in a year. And you asked a question earlier about you know why do you think so much is happening right now and it's it's taking off like Bible in a year. When you look at Bible in a year, uh you have to look at and as far as the success of it, you have to look at a couple of other things. It's not just two guys from Minnesota. It's not Father Mike and, and Jeff, and that's the reason that it is what it is. There's there's way more to that. Mm -hmm. And I think it gets back to partly the methodology of the great adventure, because when it came time to read the entire Bible over a year period, then the question, the question must arise. Well, how do we do that and correctly look at it? How do we mm -hmm. correctly do this to tell the whole story? And the answer was the great adventure methodology of the Bible timeline. So we took that and we spread it out for 365 days. And then in each of the 12 periods, I knew that people are going to get lost. And sometimes in the Old Testament, they really get lost, you know, going through Jeremiah, the longest book in the Bible. And uh, you have to know where you're at. You have to be taught. So that's why I come in at the beginning, at the beginning of every single period mm -hmm. to try to explain to people, here's where we're at, here's where we're going to go, look at your chart. And, and so those are some of the reasons. But I think the two reasons that, that this really took off when it did was, number one, the times we were living in. People had lost uh, trust in government. They lost trust in in uh, cable news and network news. They uh, they lost trust in be able to, being able to believe in something. I mean, Hollywood certainly took a lot of that away. So the the pillars that they are used to going to and trusting are all crumbling right in front of us. Is our government? Are they lying to us? Are they telling us the truth? What's going on? And even in our own city of Minneapolis and St. Paul, where we're from, there was such civil unrest. And yeah. so people have lost faith in the leadership that they have. And number two, people were lonely. Hmm. Uh, people were really lonely. They had been been watching, you know, on, on uh, television and uh, watching all these different shows and still winding up empty, you know, and they were very lonely and teenagers were lonely. And so it was right at that point when this, when this, uh, was dropped and we, um, I think we were done like in October of 20 and was it 21, 21 or 20 when it, when it came out in that January. And so I forgot about it. It was done. And so there was a couple of months there where I'm not even thinking about it and on to other things. And then January 1st, it was supposed to, to go on Apple. And it was later that afternoon that my producer called me and said, are you sitting down? And I said, uh, yeah, why? She said, you're number one in the country. I said, number one, what? I, I had no <laughs> idea what she was talking about. And she said, podcast. I said, my podcast, the Jeff Caven show. And she said, no, Bible in a year. So, oh, that's right. That's today. Bible, you were launching that, that so today. And I said, so we're number one, like a uh, Catholic podcast. No, religious. No, everything. Everything. And so naturally after that, I think we stayed at number one for like 17 days or something like that. And the, uh, all these news networks were calling, you know, and how did you guys do it? And the answer was, don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you didn't. Know. God but, did. But, yeah. But yeah. This was God. This was God. And so it kept me, it, it caught me flat footed. I couldn't take any credit for it really, you know, and father Mike can't. And so it's like, okay, that surprised both of us. God's must, God must be doing something here. Now I do think one other thing contributed to it. And that was this, 
in in presenting the the Bible in a year, in presenting the great adventure, I tell people, you can get this. You can learn this. This can be easy for you. Trust me. If I can do this, you can do this. And so we offer hope that you can get it mm -hmm. and you can understand it and can become a part of your life to where God is leading you and guiding you. He's renewing your thinking, all of that. But I think that the promise, and it's something we don't promise enough, and that is I can teach you God's word. Mm. Do I teach you everything about God's word? No, I don't know everything about God's word, but I can teach you how to read it. Mm -hmm. And I can teach you how to go through it and look at the big mountaintop experiences and the, the great leaders throughout salvation history and the work of God in their life. I can talk to you all about that, all about it. And, and I know that you can get it. I can get it. And I, and I heard hundreds and hundreds of letters of people saying that your confidence in me put me over mm. and that I, I, I knew I could do it. You know, if you felt that strong that I could do it, I, said, I feel very strong. You can do it. And the people would write back later and say, you were right. I'm getting it. I don't know everything. I said, I don't either, but I'm getting it. Mm -hmm. And that was that whole thing coming together was just the right time, uh, the right time you know, the right time and the right people and the right topic and the right, you know. Uh, Have you seen a lot of conversion? Culture? Because I feel like right now there's something really powerful going on in the church right now. Mm -hmm. I know, I, I know you've witnessed it. We've seen it with celebrities who are converting to Catholicism. I mean, Catholicism has always, has kind of been a dirty word for a long time. And all of a yep. sudden there's this openness to Catholicism. People are starting to question more Protestant denominations. We just saw we're seeing right now. I think Megan Basham's book is like number one in the, it's a number one bestseller after being out for a week exposing, um, it's kind of an expose on evangelical leadership, things like that. I mean, it's just really, we're in a really interesting time. And I feel like God is, is bringing people into the church in droves in a way we haven't seen in a while. And maybe that's my, mm -hmm. my optimism, misguided optimism, <laughs> but like, do you feel that way? And then I do have one other question. So one. Yeah, I do. Piece. I do feel that way. You know what? I'm bilingual. Um, I speak Protestant and Catholic, both without an accent. And, and I can walk into a group of evangelicals and I can talk in such a way they'd never know I was Catholic. And I can go into a group of Catholics and, they'd and talk in such a way they would never know I used to be an evangelical pastor, you know, a non, a non denominational church, I should say. Um, and so <laughs> I can't remember where I was going to go with that. I got so much I want to share with you. I keep looking at the clock thinking, oh, it'd be nice to talk more about, about all of this. But where were we on that? I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on with my my internet connection. But we were just talking about how many people are converting and, and coming into the Catholic Church right now. Yes. Um, and, and whether or not you are seeing that as well. Yes. I'll get to the answer right away before I so talk about other things. But uh, yes, I do. I see them converting. Um, and I think there's a reason why. One, and I mentioned about going back to the evangelical, my evangelical life. When I was a pastor back in the 1980s, in the 1990s, uh, the evangelical world looked different than it does today. Uh, the leadership of the evangelical church doesn't look anything like it used to back in the 80s and the 90s. We've got people like Andy Stanley, uh, who's Charles Stanley's son, with the most unbelievable assertions about the word of God and about marriage and so forth that I never thought I'd ever hear in my lifetime. Never. And there's a lot written about him. I'm not, I'm not gossiping or anything. You can go on the internet and find gazillions yeah. of videos about the leadership that's going on. And it's, it's tough. And I think that people, uh, people are losing their confidence in leadership and I, and they're looking for the roots and the, then the roads that, that run deep. And they're, and a lot of people are going back to the beginning and they are discovering this church that hasn't changed in what we believe. And it will not change in what we believe that it has stood strong all the way through. Even when we had some popes that weren't the best and we've had scandals, we certainly have, we're a family. We've had those, but we we live through them. Hopefully we grow 
and hopefully people, you know, will make their 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 ways right before you know before God, especially uh, in leadership. But I do think that this is partly due to the fact that the people that are returning or the people who are converting are thinkers. They're thinking. Mm -hmm. They are thinking and they're listening to people who think and people who who know what they're talking about, you know. And then, uh, and I, I found that the more people give ask serious questions of Christianity, Catholicism shines. It shines. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have I have really found that, you know, um, uh, I've become i become really good friend a good friend of Russell Brand. And uh, he had me come on his show. You know, he got a hold of me and said, I want you to come on my show. I'm going to talk about the Bible, talk about the Eucharist, talk about all these things. And, uh, and so I did. And I went, on, I went on his show to talk about it. And I found him to be one of the most articulate, uh, passionate people on trying to find the truth and trying to find the truth. And so we've been able to, you know, continue on in conversation and, uh, uh, and, and just walk with him as a brother, you know, as a brother in Christ and, uh, see where that goes, you know, where the Lord ends up leading him. There mm -hmm. are other people who are also thinking about, uh, the Catholic church, certainly Tammy Peterson and Jordan Peterson, uh, Tammy actually came into the church church. I think there's going to be a number of other people in the near future here that you're going to hear about that are also coming into the Catholic church. The fact that celebrities Two things. One, the fact that celebrities are coming to the Catholic Church, they're coming to Christ through the Catholic Church, is great. It it doesn't mean more than the alcoholic down the road totally. who, who just gave himself to the to the Lord. I think we need to really watch ourselves when it comes to celebrity Christianity. There's a certain joy in seeing. Uh, uh, a movement or people, but then there can be something that's very wrong with giving the uh, the credit to 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 a human being that God deserves, you know. And we got to always remember we're a family; we serve each other. The bottom bottom line is we're servants of, of one another. We are disciples of Christ, and we live in a, a a time that is ripe for trying to make celebrities out of out of Christians. And I, I would really resist that. <laughs> I am so glad that you said that because I, I that's an issue that I've taken with some of the celebrity conversions. Like instantly they're on a pedestal and the thing, I mean, the church used to have a tradition of like, if you were a new convert, you don't speak on behalf of the church or your faith for several years until, um, until you really know your faith and if, if at all. And I always tell new converts, it's really important that when you have had this major identity shift that you embrace hidden years with Christ. I mean, there are all these years with our well Lord put. that we don't read about in sacred scripture. And it's important that you come to know him as a new Catholic in this new identity that he has given you and, and learn to relate to him and know him in those hidden years quietly. You know, obviously there are opportunities that will present themselves naturally through the power of the Holy Spirit where you can share your testimony. Um, but this is not a time for you to be pontificating or or representing a larger mm -hmm. body. It's time for you to be, I mean, all of us, we need to be little. And and I think yeah. we have to be reminded of that. Um, so yeah, and we, I'm we, really we glad have to give them that. room to grow. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Room to grow. Exactly. You're, you're too young to remember, but the, years ago, there was a song, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, B.J. Thomas. Well, B.J. Thomas had a conversion to Christianity, and the church, uh, the, the evangelical community beat him up. And mm -hmm. the reason they did is he would go, he had a born-again experience, and then he would go and sing songs, and they were like, raindrops keep falling on my head and so forth. And he was booed off stage. Mm -hmm. They wanted to hear Christian music, and that was such a turnoff to him. He just passed away not too long ago. Uh, Bob Dylan, same thing, you know, we don't want to hear tangled up in blue and, you know, like a rolling stone. Or we want to hear, you, you know, me and Jesus and this and that. And I think that was probably a bit of a turnoff too. We've mm -hmm. got to give people room to, to grow. And just because a guy makes movies or sings songs or kicks around a, a football doesn't mean he needs to be in front of the group telling you what to believe. It mm -hmm. means they need to grow and that we need to as those who are more mature, I would say, protect those people. 
Don't mm-hmm. let them get out there on that circuit right away. That's, that's it's just exactly not healthy. it. I mean, it's, a, and I, it's so funny because I have said the exact same thing. We're not protecting them. And especially in that first year, there's such a high uh, rate of people of recidivism where they sort of go and they, they abandon the church then after it, sometimes because it's really hard, um, especially if you're somebody and your spouse, you've converted, but your spouse hasn't and your children haven't. And it's really hard to be going uphill against all of the people that you love in in this relational sense and so a lot of people Mm -hmm. end up leaving the church and then what we've put them on a pedestal and then they leave and it's kind of a scandal and we want to protect them from that too um and protect them from all of the bombardment of of celebrity uh just sort of that charismatic people are coming at them all the time like yes i totally agree we need to protect them and speaking of celebrity i do have one question from from a listener here and they're wondering um what do you think, this goes back to your ties with EWTN, Mother Angelica, what do you think she would say about the state of the church today? This is a little off topic, but it's it still kind of corresponds to what we're talking about with this major conversion going on. But the church itself, she's seen better days in some ways. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, dare to, to say what she would say exactly. I, I do know that mother, every time she spoke, was always drawing people back to che- to Jesus, and she was always drawing people to to Mary, our mother, and um, and she was always drawing people back to prayer. And so, you know, I, I know that whatever she notices would notice today, or whatever whatever would get her attention, I think she would respond with bringing you back to where you belong. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she would do it in her humorous way. The thing about Mother Angelica, you know, I worked with her for six years and I did her show when she was not feeling well or she was sick and she wasn't there. Sometimes we do it together. You know, she just was kind of under the weather. And um, uh, I can tell you this, the lady you saw on television is the lady that she is 23 hours the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. This it's identical. She's I love that. She, there's you know, sometimes that's not true in TV. You know, someone can be yeah. sort of sitting around rah, rah, and all of a sudden three, two, one, hello, everybody, you know. And yeah. that wasn't her. That that she would just look at the camera it was on and continue our conversation. Mm. And that was the sweet part of her. Mm, that's so beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. I just yeah, it's such a joy to listen to you, and the time just flies by. I can't believe we've already hit like over well over an hour. So well, we'll have to do it again because uh, I, I got to make a confession. I'm using a different piece of equipment here today, and there were several times when you were asking something. I don't know if it was my equipment, but I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure where we were going with it, where the question was. So it oh. might be my equipment. I got new equipment around my. My it could here. be me too. I mean, I Never my are. I feel like my brain runs at a thousand miles an hour, and I love talking about sacred scripture, and I love yeah. talking about theology and all of this. And so sometimes things come into my brain at like fire. I mean, it's just like supersonic speed, and then I can't <laughs> I, I can't ever get it all out. So I would love to have you back on. Maybe uh, I'll I'll try and do a better job of of having my. Oh no, you're doing fine. Organized. You're doing fine. It's that uh, you and I both. Uh, our minds are going very fast, you know, Yeah. and uh, it's almost like theological mental chess, you know, yeah. <laughs> thinking, okay, kind of we're going to go here. We're going to go there. Okay. I can, <laughs> but it's a, it's a delight to talk to you. And it's always fun to talk to people who are excited about scripture and, and want to go, want to go deeper. And there's so many other wonderful topics out there, you know, that <laughs> the Lord really has me right now into this. I'm doing a, a deep, deep study on simplicity. Ooh, I would love to talk to you about that. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe, yeah, if, if you can, find, I know you're going to be busy for the next several weeks caretaking for your wife. So please uh, say a prayer for yeah, Jeff's wife. Broke her leg. Yeah. She broke her leg. She had to have surgery. And so she's going to be in recovery and doing PT um, for, for some time, even after that, those initial yeah. eight weeks. For those of you that don't recovery. know what PT is, it's prayer therapy. Prayer therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and I do want to thank you too, because you, uh, if anyone's local and, and wants to, uh, can, or has considered becoming a part of the catechetical Institute, uh, I know my parish St. Anne and Hamill has a saddle. They're going to be a satellite church for, for the catechetical Institute. And I highly recommend it. I did this program 
I've, I just had my firstborn at the beginning at do, doing pillar one. I had a newborn. And then at the end of uh, pillar four, I had another newborn. That was my second child. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and it was amazing. And it's a program. You get out of it what you put into it. The, but the the lectures are amazing. And <laughs> um, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Well, I appreciate that. Program. Yeah, it's a, the, the Catechetical Institute is, has been an incredible blessing not only for me, but I think for the archdiocese going yes. through the whole catechism in two years, you know, really, yep. really a lot of fun. Well, great. We'll, we'll schedule another one. We'll get together. Sounds really good. Thank you so much for coming on today. And a big thanks to everyone who tuned in and, and had questions. God bless you guys. And we will definitely see you around soon.